Welcome to DEFCON 17. I'm dead addict. Can I, can I have a, a show of hands for everyone uh, that was at DEFCON 1? Everyone that was at DEFCON 1? Excellent. Very good. <laughs> now, now uh, I, I hate to ask personal questions of, of the audience, but is, is there anyone in the room that's under 16? Anyone under 16? Thank God, I would feel so much older. <laughs> if this room was packed, I swear to God, like five hands would drop up and, and I'd be like, oh wow, you, you weren't born when, when this all started. There's more staff members at DEF CON 17 than there were attendees at DEF CON 1. This is going to be a rambling, long tale. Um, of remembrances. Um, I'm essentially going to try to, to, to do this speech in the same way, in the same methodology that I uh, did my DEF CON 1 speech. And uh, you'll see later in, in one of these uh, disheveled pictures somewhere my notes from my DEF CON 1 speech that are scribbled on a piece of paper that I wrote an hour before the speech. So let me give you a little background of, about myself and how this all started. Um, that's who I was 17 years ago. I had longer hair then. Um, honestly, about two weeks ago, my hair was that length, so, so it's not actually that dramatically different. Um, this is, is, is who I am. I'm actually the same person. I'll, I'll be honest about that. I'm a little aged, but beyond that, I'm the same person. 17 years ago, I moved to Seattle, and I moved from Arizona, and I moved from the jurisdiction of Gail Thackeray. I don't know if anyone here knows who Gail Thackeray is. Um, any hands for remembrances of uh, one of the more famous prosecutors of hackers, Operation Sun Devil. Uh, the prosecuting attorney for Operation Sun Devil lived in my area code, and um, I don't know, I was uh, 18 or so when I was uh, living in Arizona, and I had uh, the judgment of an 18-year-old and, and the curiosity and uh, um, um, desire to go where I shouldn't that many people in this room probably have to this day. Um, so I, 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 at one point I asked her uh, several years after knowing Gail, so did you ever have a file on me? Were, ever, you, were you ever investigating me? And she's like, no, I didn't, Eli. Um, no, no, no file on you. And I'm like, I kind of felt insulted because uh, there were six members of our crew. Five of them uh, got busted uh, by Gail Thackeray. And I'm, th I'm thankful and was thankful and I'm continually thankful that those other five that were busted didn't look to me as the asshole that ratted them out because I wasn't. I didn't. But it looks bad. And hackers are paranoid, uh, particularly when they're getting busted. It's reasonable. It's a reasonable thing. So. When I was 19 years old, I moved to Seattle, and one of the things I, I did when I moved is I uh, checked out the local bulletin board scene uh, and found the local interesting underground BBSs. And uh, I was a little bit of a social engineer at the time, and so what I like to do is break into chat with a sysop and convince them how cool I was and how they should give me elite access. Not, 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 not just to their silly elite areas, but I want to be co-admin of everything. And uh, that's kind of was my mentality. I was co-administrator of a lot of uh, boards with lots of fun uh, criminal activity going on. Um, at the time, I was a founding member of a group that had uh, sort of dissolved, uh, nearly dissolved that after I uh, left the area, which was the NSA. Not, not that NSA, the National Security Anarchists. Um, years later, I met someone from the NSA that, that uh, they did what a, they call a backronym and he created a, a, a team called Snack and, and he came up with the acronym first and then figured out what it meant later and I'm like, wow, what a coincidence because I did the same thing a number of years ago. Um, I, I think I was more amused about that than he was. So I, I, moved, to, I moved to Seattle and uh, I uh, broke into chat with the, the Dark Tangent on the Dark Tangent BBS. Um, and it, with the intent of trying to con myself some codemin access. Unfortunately, the darkest of tangents is more clever than most of us. 
And uh, not only did I not get my co-admin access, but suddenly he was talking about this nifty thing he was going to do. And if I wanted to be helpful, which I didn't actually want to be as a co-admin, I'll be honest, I just, just wanted the power and, and access and whatnot. But if I wanted to be helpful, I would help him with a project he was uh, working on uh, called DEF CON. And I'm like, oh, that sounds like fun. Bring, bring together a bunch of hackers. And um, Vegas was a different place at the time. Uh, Vegas wasn't trying to be uh, friendly to families. They were pretty honest about their sin. You go to Vegas for debauchery, for alcohol, for gambling. It, honestly, it, it, it was a sinister town filled with sin, but there was honesty in the sin then. Um, and at the time, no one in their right friggin' minds would ever go to Vegas in the middle of the summer. <laughs> Um, now there's a huge convention business, uh, despite the economy, that rolls throughout the entire year. But at the time, the middle of the summer in Las Vegas was a pretty empty place and a pretty reasonable cheap rate uh, to, to get some conference space. Um, and, and DT handled all that. He chose the place. He chose the venue. You'll, you'll notice uh, um, throughout this, uh, DT was the mastermind and I was the minion. But I had vision. Uh, as well, and I, I had uh, things to contribute. A, a number of years after DEF CON uh, uh, had been existing, uh, I was writing up a little uh, bio about the beginning of DEF CON, and I was writing, the beginning of DEF CON, a small group of hackers, and uh, Jeff says to me, what are you talking about, a small group of hackers? It was just you and me, dude. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay, well, it, it felt like more. And, and someone, some, someone asked me uh, recently, y you know, well, what was DEF CON 1 like? Um, and I'm like, well, I've been researching it. <laughs> and unfortunately, that, that, that's sort of true. I have been researching it. Um, I don't know if many of you are veterans of DEF CON, but it's true that there will be occasional memory lapses if you're doing it right. So let me go back to, to a little bit about who I was. Um, I was a member of a, a, a pirate group. I was the uh, uh, one of the founders of that 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 poor idea, the National Security Anarchists. I was um, uh, kind of all about group affiliations. Um, I was co-admin of a lot of things. Today, I'm co-admin of nothing. Um, I affiliate with no groups. I'm not a member of anything. Um, I give the EFF money each year, and they're like, "Great, we'd like to sign you up." I'm like, "No, no, no. Here's some more money. I don't need to be on your rolls. That's fine." Um, I'm, I guess what you would say, more risk averse now than I was, and I think that comes with age. Um, and, and while I am all suited up, I, I will be honest, this is the first suit I've owned in my life, and, and I just got this to look silly at the conference. So that's Gail Thackeray. That's a sphere. I'll show you what that is for in a bit. Let me tell you a little bit about the philosophy that I had going into this. And, and DEF CON, one of the, the people, people talk about, well, was DEF CON the first hacker con? Not at all. DEF CON wasn't even close to the first hacker con. It was possibly, however, the first conference where everyone was invited that wasn't an invite-only conference. And the idea behind an invite-only conference is kind of nifty. Well, it'll be secret, and we'll just invite our friends, and, and no one will know about it, and it'll be an elite bunch of hackers, big secretive meeting. And if you look at the, the history of the computer underground, and, and when I first started, I read everything that was ever published about it, which in 1991 was actually a, a feat you could accomplish. Um, and consistently at every one of these conferences, every one of these private elite small closed conferences, the feds were there. Law enforcement was there. They knew. They infiltrated all these BBSs. And then so they would bust down some doors because people were doing some stupid things at the conference. And yeah, I'm, I'm sure that doesn't happen at DEF CON. Um, so we decided, look, the feds are going to come. And, and in our mind, feds was a generic term for law enforcement, for, for the intelligence community, for prosecutors, all of those people that could possibly get us uh, innocent folks who like to explore. Um, they were the feds. So we're like, fuck it, we'll just invite them. They're going to come anyways, and if we invite them, and if we ask them to come to our conference, then at least everyone at the conference will be painfully aware, yes, there are feds running around here. Um, don't be stupid in front of them. Uh, exercise some caution. 
But al also at the time, uh, and, and it was essentially, I, I kind of visualized this complex balance of things in my head. And, and I, I, I sort of feel, feel that that balance is, is worked through the years and, and was a reasonable one. So one, let's bring the feds in. Um, two, well, sometimes feds, particularly back then, uh, when they were new to investigating cybercrime, uh, sometimes uh, the feds did inappropriate things. They busted people in inappropriate ways. Um, they didn't follow due process. So we thought we'd invite the press, too. Um, because if there's anything that uh, uh, bad acts don't like and, and uh, inappropriate actions by law enforcement and government doesn't like, it's a big spotlight. So that was another equation. We'll invite the press. We'll, we'll recruit actively to get the press here. Um, and we got the press. Um, and I'll show you a couple of uh, uh, pictures of, of articles that were taken. Robert X. Cringely came. Uh, someone from uh, Unix World came. Um, it, and and uh, I have a fax that we, we sent off to Rolling Stone, uh, trying, trying to get Rolling Stone to come. And we were, we were sort of begging them. Um, so the other piece was civil libertarians and lawyers. Well, Let's get the feds here, the press to cover it, and then the lawyers to defend and, and watch over everything if anything goes bad. Which all sounds kind of convoluted and silly, but if you look back at the history of DEF CON, having the civil libertarians here has been really, really useful. Um, and the EFF uh, turned into an organization, instead of a, a grassroots sort of civil libertarian organization, it turned into an organization that's uh, lobbying and uh, a litigation-based activism, which I'm thrilled about. I, I continue to support the EFF. Um, and we invited the EFF. Um, at the time, the EFF said that um, they, it wasn't their, their funding, they, did, they couldn't get here because of financial reasons. Um, but we invited the CPSR which were uh, the Computer Professionals for Social Responsibility. A lovely bunch of folks. Um, initially, they were going to call themselves Nerds Against Nukes, but they didn't think they'd be taken as seriously if they had that title. So we brought Gail Thackeray in, and it wasn't an easy thing. It was probably the most difficult recruiting of any of the DEF CON 1 speakers, certainly. And I, I, I remember this conversation, or I remember memories of this conversation, because memory is a, a tricky thing, and uh, I don't know if I've given lengthy disclaimers yet, but all of this could very well be fiction. Uh, it is based on 16-year-old memories that uh, uh, alcohol fuzzed, potentially. Um, so I, I, I called up Gail Thacker, and I'm like, Gail, we're, we're, we have this conference, and it's a bunch of um, sort of hackers. We'd love for you to speak there. And Gail Thackeray, and I don't blame her one bit for this, she, she, her reaction was, really? So you want me to speak in front of a group of criminals and what, give them advice? Tell them how to evade um, the law? What exactly do you want, 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 want from that? And, and initially the first conversation didn't go well. Um, and I called her back a couple of weeks later, and honestly, I, I have no idea how I convinced her to come. Um, and I, I credit her immensely. I, I can't credit Gail Thackeray enough. Um, she had bravery. She stepped out of her comfort zone. She did something that undoubtedly her colleagues would tell her she was insane. Um, and what she did is she set a precedent, I think. And the precedent really was a communication between uh, law enforcement and the hacker community. And there was some hostility, certainly, because she'd prosecuted friends uh, of many attendees, including myself. Um, but we gained insights about what they cared about. And really, there, there are bad people doing bad things, and they use computers as tools to do those bad things. And, and she realized, and I think the law enforcement, and, and we'll call them feds collectively, realized that <coughs> The people that call themselves hackers, even though they might have broken countless laws and did so pathologically and continuously, did not have the motivations that they expected from criminals. We were criminals that had no financial motivation. Um, there was no crimes of passion. There wasn't violence associated. There wasn't, we weren't part of a mafia. Well, you know, of sorts. There was. Uh, to, call, talk, to call the hacker community organized, I think, would, would be highly inappropriate. Um, and, and so I, I think what happened is that 
when she came, she gained insight and then opened the doors to allow further uh, law enforcement and, and whatnot to come. And eventually, at a certain point, and I'll, I'll try not to look fo too much forward, I, wanna, I do want to focus on DEF CON 1, but eventually the threats that, that were in cyberspace were not from the hackers anymore. There were actual real scary criminals out there. And for the most part, law enforcement has all of their energies dealing with those bad, scary criminals. And so the people that explore, um, not on the top of their agenda. <coughs> also at DEF CON 1, um, there was not a dot com. So, um, well, or, or there might have just been a dot com. And I remember the crossover. I wasn't a university student, so I had no dot edu accounts. And if I wanted to get on the internet, largely I had to break the law. If I wanted to use a Unix system, largely I had to break the law. Um, and I remember when the, the first versions of Linux came out and my, my hacker friends were downloading it so they could hack themselves as opposed to hacking other people so they can hone their techniques on their own systems as opposed to learning how to exploit things on other systems. Um, I'll get to Dan Farmer in a second. <coughs> I want to talk about uh, another one of my mistakes. And there's a number of mistakes that I was involved with. Jeff did a lot of really, uh, had a lot of really good ideas that executed really well. And, and I, I believe I, I contributed to that, that complex relationship of all the players that should be involved. Uh, I think I might have done that right. But one of the things I did wrong was invite a friend of mine who was a mentor to me. Um, his name was Dark Druid. He had more skills than I had. He was several years my junior. I was 18 or 19. He was 16 or so. Um, and and he, had, he had creative abilities and created his own tax and, and, and really was a bright guy. And he would have been a great speaker and he would have given a great speech. The problem was he was lived in my area code or my old area code 602 in Arizona and he was currently being prosecuted by Gail Thackeray. Dark Druid's speech ended up being about his passion for cars. And it probably wasn't the most compelling content, but I don't blame him one bit. And that was certainly a tactical error on my part. Dan Farmer. Dan Farmer was, if I recall, the first corporate security type that we had. And he didn't look like a corporate security type, but he was working at Sun Microsystems. And he had a lot of skills. And he walked in the room with two girls on his side, and um, I believe Robert X. Cringely later characterized his presence at the conference uh, as making out with those girls at the back of the room for most of the conference, and then getting on stage eventually. And some of the contents of his speech were, were really quite impressive. Essentially, he admonished all the hackers in the room, and at first everyone was like, oh, here's a corporate guy that's going to tell us to quit being bad and, and, and to quit messing stuff up. And that wasn't really what Dan Farmer was all about. Dan Farmer was all about you're doing it wrong. You're not using advanced techniques. If you want to hack, here's how you really should hack, and then dropped a lot of deep knowledge on everyone and encouraged everyone to get more badass. Dan, in some regards, and, and, and throughout the years of DEF CON, there have been other characters and other people that have very large personalities and that are very well known and, and uh, affectionately we'll call them rock stars. Um, now, it's funny, it's, it's famous rock stars in a global community of, I don't know, 15,000, right? So, so <laughs> the rock stars when they go to DEF CON and when they go to other conferences, they aren't really rock stars. But I would say Dan Farmer was the original DEF CON rock star. Um, and, and he was a character. Oh. Let me see here. I'm going to show you some pictures. That is a sketch that DT did. And the sketch was of the first DEF CON logo. And uh, scribbled on a piece of paper and uh, kind of a rough sketch. And um, I, I'd like to thank Dark Tangent, by the way, for getting me addicted. And I am dead addict. Mr. Tangent got me addicted to Mountain Dew. And I had no caffeine addiction before I met him, but working on programs at 3 a.m. Uh, really um, 
really fueled the Mountain Dew addiction. And there's some shots from DEF CON. There's Kale. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> that was a fun shot. There was a professional photographer uh, present, and it was a sister of one of our speakers. Um, and the speaker, I, 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 I explained, so we had a, a civil lawyer at DEF CON. They're like, oh, what do they talk about it? And Curtis Carnow, uh, who's quite, uh, has built up an impressive resume over the years since he's been at DEF CON 1, but Curtis Carnow had a DEF CON speech one, a DEF CON 1 speech, and the contents of it was um, legal implications of autonomous interactions of agents in cyberspace. So you have multiple um, uh, independent uh, autonomous agents that are authored by various parties and there's a transaction that begins from one and ends at the other and goes through all the ones in the middle and something goes wrong, who's liable? <laughs> and lawyers love that question, who's liable? That's their favorite question. That is a famous picture of uh, people trying to hurt themselves in a bug. Um, and I was not in that picture, thankfully, because um, I, I, I think I would have gotten very hurt. So a little bit about the swag. And yeah, come up here with this, please. You're about to see the first DEF CON t-shirt ever. And in the front, you'll see the evolution of the design I showed you before. And I think it's pretty nifty. 1991, that was Dark Tangent. Dark Tangent sketched it out. I showed you the sketch earlier, a little gradient, a little work on that. Um, it's, a, it's a clean t-shirt design. Uh, that front is a good front. And um, if you can turn that t-shirt around, I'll show you my contribution. That is how you don't design a t-shirt. So there's a couple of elements there. Dense text um, in tiny fonts that requires several minutes of you standing still with your back facing someone till they can finally read it. Now, just a, a, a quick uh, resume advice for everyone here. At one point, uh, because I helped design that t-shirt, ah, I, I did the back. Um, uh, and and I'll, I'll tell you what that text is because you sure as heck can't read it easily. Um, but I, I put it on my resume. I'm like, oh, I did something. I should shove it on my resume. And one day, uh, a Microsoft contract agency called me up and said, we, we saw that you have t-shirt design on your resume. And there's this mic group in Microsoft that wants a group t-shirt design for their event. And I, I said, oh. Well, I apologize. I'm taking that off my resume right now. Um, while I did do that, I didn't do it well, and you don't want me doing that. So the advice is, anything you don't ever want to do again, or you weren't really good at, take it off your resume, even if you did it before. Yeah, and it's white. So, wow, this is nice and faded. So let me, let me read you a little bit from this. Uh, at the top it says, if privacy is outlawed, only outlaws will have privacy. And I think some of these things uh, spoke to the original ethos of, of DEF CON, the original kind of where our minds were. Um, protect your privacy, encrypt your data, use your rights while you still have them. PGP is not a crime. At the time, Phil Zimmerman was being actively investigated for exporting uh, PGP, uh, which he was accused of doing. And there was some real concern that there'd be law enforcement action against him. Uh, along with the EFF, we invited Phil Zimmerman to DEF CON 1. And again, there were financial issues that prevented him from coming. He came to DEF CON 2. And um, yeah, I don't. <laughs> One of my favorite moments of DEF CON 2 was pulling out a hacky sack and begging uh, Zimmerman to, to try this hacking sack thing out. Um, and he was puzzled and didn't understand it, and I begged him, and he did. And quickly, two dozen hackers ran around in a circle. And I did that merely um, so I could say I, I, I hacked with Zimmerman. <coughs> so there's some other dense text here, um, and it's the Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment of 1789, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's uh, the Fourth Amendment of 1995, 
Um, and I'll see if I can read it here a little bit. It's a quote from J.P. Barlow. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects, um, searches and seizures may be suspended to protect public welfare. Upon the unsupported suspicion of law enforcement officials, any place or conveyance shall be subject to immediate search and any such places or conveyances or properties within them may be permanently confiscated without um, uh, certain judicial proceedings. Um, so I, I'm kind of proud of those sentiments and those words were really good words and if any of you in the future should have a chance to design a t-shirt, don't use lots of dense text. Um, thank you for that. That was the other hand that was up when I asked who was at DEF CON 1. Another idea we had for swag was notebooks. Uh, at the time, uh, it was sort of a custom to have uh, what we call hacker notebooks. And it was just a, uh, a normal notebook. And what you would do is write obscure, uh, sometimes codified data of uh, IP addresses and telephone numbers and login names and passwords. And you'd scribble them incoherently. And they'd be in margins. And, and they'd be everywhere. And sometimes there was some encoding. So if anyone found it, they'd have no idea what they're looking at. Seemed rather impractical. Um, So we created these. It's a notepad for all this information. And so you can write down all the system details and keep track of them in a nice, clean, clear format and be able to refer to them later. Two large problems with this. One, it's inappropriate to try to sell data that is easily duplicated to a bunch of hackers. There are a few takers, and by takers, I mean they saw the pads of paper that we were selling, they took one piece of them, and then they walked away. And, and, and uh, if I recall, with, with some exceptions throughout the history of DEF CON, largely, uh, other than some DJs, and if people pay money to DJs for their CDs, obviously they can get that music online. They're trying to support the artists. That's very straightforward. Um, but a, as a rule, the uh, selling easily duplicatable data uh, hasn't been done since so much. The other concerning thing about these, uh, these easy to read notepads was uh, Gail Thackeray's endorsement, which really wasn't a good thing. That wasn't a pleasant thing. I don't think it helped sales. She was excited about these notebooks and she was explaining what a pain in the ass it was when they busted someone's door down and confiscated their notebooks to decrypt this massive data that was so hard and it was almost useless. And if hackers would just use this notepad, their job would be so much easier. Fuck. <laughs> now, if she really wanted to help her cause, she would have said how what a horrible thing it was and how she'd be scared away and that'd be That'd be very bad. Um, <coughs> one, one, of the, um, one of the things I remember Gail Thackeray saying at uh, DEF CON 1 was, um, uh, and the quote is, drug dealers give themselves better legal advice than hackers do. And essentially what that means is when your hacker buddy that you're sitting next to is trying to know, here's how the law works, don't fucking listen to them, all right? The EFF has a booth, there's actual lawyers running around, um, the advice is generally not good. An example that she used and she found hilarious was the banners and BBSs and also the quizzes you had to get into the elite access of these BBSs. I don't, I don't know if anyone remembers this, but, but there was a time when if you wanted to get access to the illegal, illicit content where bad things were happening, you would have to prove that you were elite. By doing that, you would have to, I don't know, list off what acronyms meant that were computer related and, and answer a bunch of silly questions and, and any jack, oh, also you had to affirm, solemnly affirm that you were not a member of law enforcement, you did not work for a software company, you did not work for the Business Software Association to make all these assertions. Gail Thackeray called that intent. <laughs> yeah, and there's uh, an analogy she used is that there's no, there's no magic words uh, uh, you can say to a hooker to ensure that they're not actually an undercover police officer. Police are allowed to lie on these things. Police are allowed to lie. Um, and 
Furthermore, to I, I think the community's uh, 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 embarrassment, she collected all these banners and, and like put them all together and passed them around her law enforcement friends and got a huge chuckle over the whole thing. There are a number of questions that uh, Gail, Th Gail Thackeray fielded uh, when she spoke, and they were pretty hilarious too. And they went something like this. So Gail, if I have, or I have encrypted on my hard drive, 40 gigs, or whatever the appropriate uh, data size of people's hard drives was back then, I have no idea, uh, of data, and then I transfer that data via an encrypted link to my friend on the other side, and then they get the 40 gigs worth of wares, and Gil, in a number of these, she, she like rolled her eyes and, and put her head down, and, and she, she's like, hypothetically, you mean hypothetically if you had this data that you're trying to transfer from one point to the other. And I, I, I could see, and she didn't have arrest powers, and, and honestly, she didn't want to bust anyone there. Um, and, and here, I'll, I'll go back. There's a picture of me and Gail. Uh, there we are. In this picture, um, me and Gail sitting down, having some beers, having some drinks, having a good time. And someone's like, hey, mind if we take your picture? And she's like, oh, yeah, that's great. We'll take pictures, no problems. And I'm like, hey, let's cheers to, you know, hanging out and having fun. Woo! And um, I was 19 at the time. Gail, lovely, lovely person she was, might have um, assumed that I was underage. Not her problem, per se, but um, at that point, she's like, hey, um, uh, DA, you don't happen to, to have an ID on you with your age on it or anything at the moment, do you? And I'm like, oh, shoot. I think I left it in my hotel room. And uh, she's like, so, eh, why don't we just put down these beers and then we'll take the picture. And, um, and that was lovely and I was willing to do so and it was a very gracious thing for, for her to allow. Um, Mark Lud Ludwig was another one of our speakers. Mark Ludwig uh, was the author of The Little Black Book of Computer Viruses and he was quite a character. Um, and, and the DEF CON 1 speeches are online and I, I recommend you review them except for mine. Um, which I, I, I enjoyed giving that speech. It was a fun speech to give. Um, Mark Ludwig, I think, was a, a very keen representation of the libertarian tendencies within the hacker community. Um, and he was very much a libertarian um, and strongly held libertarian beliefs. And um, he got a lot of resistance from the antiviral community and he had hostility towards them as his little black book of computer viruses contained assembly code. Uh, so you could, whew, yeah, and, and anyone that wants to type in assembly code from a book, um, I don't know, I remember typing in programs from magazines way back when, but um, have fun with that. Um, but, but he believed in the First Amendment strongly and he was passionate about the First Amendment and, and I think that's something that, that we've all had throughout the years and, and has been a running theme of DEF CON and I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled about that. And, and one, of the, one of the things that he pointed out, if I recall in his speech, was that in Arizona you needed a license to own a printing press. And, and he was indeed a publisher, so this directly affected him. But it was very disturbing to him, the idea that the government could revoke your right to publish at any time. Now, presumably the reasons for this is, is if you actually owned a uh, printing press, there were dangerous chemicals and, and you had uh, potentially toxic material that you had a lot of. Um, and I, I won't speak to the merits of that argument or what the intent was of the Arizona legislature in, in, in creating that license. And frankly, I don't even know if that, uh, the accuracy of the statement. But it was an interesting thing he said and um, worthy of thought for me. Um, This was our original uh, uh, badge, and it's tiny, and it's uh, laminated. And I'm not sure if this one was counterfeited, but uh, over the years, if you notice the progression of badges, they get more and more complex. There was one, uh, I think it was printed in Austria, that, that had oil and, and little things that moved around in the oil. <laughs> 
all of these things were to prevent counterfeiters. Um, and, and we appreciate the, the sentiment of counterfeiters, and we never really disliked them, but um, it was a bit of a, a, a war, and, and the people would counterfeit our badges, and then we'd be like, fine, we'll make better badges next year. Um, and if you've noticed the badges over the past few years, um, if you can recreate those various boards, um, good on you, and you'd probably get a prize. At, at one point, we, we tried to track down someone that we had had the understanding he had been counterfeiting badges for years and years and years, and we wanted to talk to him. Now, the thing was, um, he wasn't actually mass counterfeiting them, he was counterfeiting them for personal use. And when we wanted to talk to him, we wanted him to uh, speak at our conference about the process that he went through in, in counterfeiting these materials. Um, I'm not sure he ever believed in the sincerity of the offer. It was sincere, but he didn't necessarily follow through. Uh, I think there's one more directory here that has some interesting pictures. Uh, soon, soon. There are a number of press articles written about us. Ah, ah there we go. There's the, uh, the notepads, the bust me notepads, I think we later called them. Um, the future of the computer underground, I believe was my first speech. And I ended up speaking two or three times at DEF CON merely because other speakers fell through and they dropped off and suddenly we had an empty slot um, in DEF CON 1, there was one track of speaking, uh, maybe 120 people there. But when one person drops out uh, and you only have one track, you really need to come up with something else. So I, I had a lot of fun with the, the future of the computer underground. And I remember one of the um, predictions I had would be that the ubiquitousness of Windows NT on the internet, and essentially it wasn't on the internet at all at the time, and it was sort of a crazy and silly prediction, you know, why, why would people run Windows machines on the internet? Still a valid question, I'll, I'll give you that. <laughs> um, I'm not sure I was uh, vindicated or saddened by, by the end result of that. Ah, um, uh, yes. And that, that, that picture, uh, and you saw a larger picture earlier, the, the woman photographer, I think that was an interesting um, a look at what early press was, um, and there was there were sort of two types of reporters that have covered DEF CON over the years, and we've tried to get rid of one of those types. Um, and I mean, no local, no no offense to to any anyone who's local to any area anywhere, but local media. Um, I think they came to DEF CON one. I think we told them to leave. Um, we didn't want those articles. And and the depth of the reporting and the focus of the reporting. Oh my God, scary hackers. Was, uh, was, was not so much. Um, and, and that picture, essentially, the, the photographer chose the most interesting looking people. And that was the basis of her composition, which is a fair thing. She's a photographer, she composes images. And, and the relevance of the people involved, it, it really didn't matter. She just wanted a, a pretty picture. And later, in later years, CNN would show up. And in this case, you know, photographer doing some personal photographs. There was no, no end game um, and sh sh showed up in this magazine, New Media Magazine, which has since been defunct. But um, CNN would later come to DEF CON and they would use the same strategy. Well, we see a guy with a mohawk. We would like to talk to him. We have three minutes that we're going to show about your conference. And there's several people with piercings that look menacing that we would like to talk to. Really? Well, we have lots of bright people here. Some of them kind of look different. No, 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 no. We want the Mohawks. Um, and uh, if you've noticed, there hasn't been any CNN coverage or uh, uh, CBS or, or any, any uh, nighttime news or anything like that. No, no three-minute spots. We don't want them. Um, and in the beginning, I, I sort of I had a passion about media and had an interest in media. And, and since then, I, I've been a press goon for the past number of years. Um, and I don't know. At one point, I said I was about 40% of DEF CON 1. 
And DEF CON 1 was a lot of planning, and, and um, I didn't realize how much work it was until I went through my old files, and I, then I saw all of this source material, all these people we tried to contact, all this work that we did beforehand, and, and I didn't have that memory at all. Um, and now the, the effort is, is incredible, and there's probably 200 staff members and, and months and months of prep work that, that go into it before the conference. The article that you see, if you'll notice, it's called What Was Your Best Hack? And I think that was also indicative of the quality of the media. And I, I know that journalist, and, and she was a lovely woman, and I have nothing against her. But that was the sort of perspective that the, um, the security, the, there was no such thing as security press by and large. And it was mainstream media attempting to cover these security related issues. Now there's not only technical press that's focused on technical issues, but there's, there's also security technical press. And there's actually reasonable coverage that's being given to issues. And um, by and large, we try to vet those reporters that try to get into this conference. So hopefully they're not jackasses. Um, and uh, there, there I am. If you look under the overheard, if you can uh, read that at all. Um, this is from Unix World. 1993, and uh, I guess um, I guess you'll you'd say I, I, at the time I, I might have been considered what what you call a media whore, and I was happy to talk to all media about anything. Um, now I'm happy to give them background on things and don't really want to be quoted as much. One of the good things about our friend Unix, there's source code there. Which wasn't entirely true because uh, Unix didn't exactly come with source code. Linux came with source code. Um, and I misspoke and uh, Unix World happily quoted me and um, I, I found that very interesting. Robert X. Cringely. He was our biggest reporter that we had that came to DEF CON and he was an interesting character. One of the lovely things about Vegas, 17, 16 years ago, all cellular traffic was analog. This made for a lot of fun. The amount of people with radios percentage-wise was much, much higher than it is now. Um, and those radios were modified so they could listen in on anything they wanted. And Listening in on telephone conversations hasn't really been a hobby of mine, but it's been a hobby of friends of mine in the past, and, and I've been at their house while they're going through and listening to various conversations. And um, much like reading email, telephone conversations are boring. Um, not, only, not only are strangers telephone conversations boring, but if you think about it, listen, over, overhear what your friends are saying on the phone sometimes, and, and just listen to their conversations. They're incredibly boring. Honey, I'll be home at this time, and okay, we'll pick up some eggs and stuff, and I'm going to be late for this, and you know, sorry, boss, I'm not feeling well. People have boring telephone conversations. Similarly, there's fr they have freaking boring email, unless you're targeting some attack to read someone's email. Reading volumes of email is, is about as interesting as reading YouTube comments. Um, there was an exception, however, and that was Las Vegas. Las Vegas is an interesting city. <laughs> Telephone conversations in Las Vegas are a lot more fun. Uh, some of the toughest drug laws in the country, and yet apparently lots of drugs being consumed in this city. And people were happy to chat about that on their cellular phones. That's fun. Again, prostitution, it's illegal in this city. Very, very interesting. Illegal in the city, as it is most places in the country. Of course, it's not illegal in the state, but it's illegal in the city. Um, and yet, Lots and lots and lots of conversations regarding prostitution. And essentially, sex and drugs, I mean, all, all you have left is rock and roll, and you can listen to that. You don't need to listen to conversations about that. It was, it was good stuff. Um, Robert X. Cringely uh, received a phone call, because all there was was analog cell phones. Um, he received a phone call while he was at, at the conference. He was in the main conference room. And, and to be polite, he started to move outside of the conference room so he could have a conversation without, uh, you know, with a little bit of privacy. But as his phone rang, uh, four or five scanners suddenly went off and uh, his conversation, there was almost feedback going on. Um, and, and while I did leave the room, I think he realized there wasn't much of a point of it. Um,
Yeah, Cringely was lots of fun. Vegas hackers will reveal hidden calls in Windows 3.1 to LA party girls. <laughs> Which pretty much was typical of his writing style at the time and, and uh, the info world uh, articles that he wrote. But at the time, info world for me was this sort of a seminal publication to keep track of the industry. It was a weekly magazine. Um, you know, there, there wasn't a World Wide Web when, when DEF CON started, so how you got your information was weekly magazines like this, and, and uh, I, I read them uh, thoroughly, and it was quite a thrill to, to have Cringely around. Um, does anyone have any questions? Does anyone have any uh, wonder about what happened at DEF CON 1? Um, I'll admit there are certain things that I will not reveal on stage taped. Um, and I'll, I'll also uh, admit that makes for potentially somewhat of a less interesting talk. Um, but as, as Gail Thackeray told me several, several years after knowing her, when I was pretty excited because I, I quit being active at about right before DEF CON 1 and after seven years passed by, um, I was thrilled because suddenly all of those potential crimes that I had committed were all eased away by history. Now, I'm going to tell you this, but please don't take it as legal advice. Please go see a lawyer if you have questions about this sort of thing. Um, Gail told me this about the Statue of limita Limitations as I was giddily bouncing about at being able to suddenly tell all these fun tales about my, my poor judgment youth. And I'm like, yeah, I, I can finally talk. And Gail says, well, you misunderstand how the Statue of Limitations works, you dead addict. The way it works is the, the, the clock starts ticking the moment we realize a crime occurred. Fuck! Well, that's not fair. I mean, it's true, I never got caught for anything, but the mere fact that I never got caught maybe means that no one ever knew that any crimes were committed. So 15 years later, as I'm telling old war stories, I don't want cuffs slapped on me. Again, this is not legal advice, but uh, you might want to think about this uh, before telling your war stories. Or, or fuzz them appropriately. Um, we've come a long way since then. I think the ideals of DEF CON have stayed the same, and those those elements that, that made it um, interesting. And there, there, were, there were other things that went on at, at DEF CON 1, like uh, raiding AT&T and trashing them in Las Vegas, arguably the most secure city in the, the country. Um, let's go raid the local telco. Um, and, and, and these were, uh, things that were initiated by attendees, and essentially that's been a uh, tradition that sort of started at DEF CON, um, unofficial events where everyone will go and go ahead and do something. And attendees have essentially created all of the uh, auxiliary content, the things other than the speeches, the contests, the game shows, all of these things have been created by attendees who have an idea, and they say, wow, wouldn't it be cool if we could do this? And, and uh, Dark Tangent's response is, oh, if you want to do this, then we'll provide some space, and if it works out, maybe we'll advertise you next year. And essentially, this entire conference is created by the attendees and by the people that have a passion for the conference. And one of the things we always like to say is DEF CON is not a spectator sport. Um, and I, there are legitimate complaints to be had, the crowding, the, the hallways at times, logistical problems that occur. But by and large, when people complain about their DEF CON experience as a whole, um, I tell them DEF CON is what you make of it. Um, and throughout the years, I often think about the time in between DEF CONs as just filler time between when I really live. And I hope you all have an excellent time at DEF CON. And thank you for coming. And um, thank you.